Good morning, everybody. It's the Open Door Bible Church. Um, today we're going to be in 2 Corinthians, and we're going to do two chapters today, 5 and 6. <coughs> we had a little technical difficulty today, so, but we told that old devil that not today, Satan, so we got to back up. If that doesn't work, we got one more backup, so. So 2 Corinthians 5. Now, these two chapters are loaded with doctrine, and there's a lot of new doctrine. But since there's a lot here, uh, I'm not going to explain the stuff that we've already had in previous chapters. I'll just briefly go over it, just, just to keep this uh, not too long. Um, so, uh, let's start with verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So, I love the use of Paul's words here. For we know, not we think or we hope, but we know, that if our earthly house, this earthly body is destroyed, dies, then we will receive a divine new body, eternal in the heavens. Remember that Jesus told his disciples on the eve before his death, as written down in John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a house for you. So Jesus is already hard at work in heaven, preparing a place for us and knowing the power that Jesus has and the amount of time that he's been working on our house in heaven, what a mansion or a palace that will be. The righteous would be put into their graves all weary and worn, uh, but as such they will not rise. They go to the grave with furrowed brows, hollow cheeks, and wrinkled skin. But even before our worn out body is buried in the grave, we will already be in heaven, in full beauty and in full glory, with a brand new resurrected body. Salvation isn't just for the soul or the spirit, but for the body also. Resurrection is how God saves our bodies. We will have a glorious new body to come for those of us who are fighting afflictions our new heavenly bodies can't come fast enough. All right, let's do verses uh, 2 through 4 next. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is, in, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Christians, especially us older ones, or ones who have a certain physical or mental disability, therefore groan because we see both the limitations of our current body and minds versus the superiority of the body and mind to come. Like I just mentioned in our previous verse, we are earnestly desiring our new resurrected bodies. And when Paul says here, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, he is simply stating that in eternity, we will be clothed and not naked. Or in other words, we will just not be a bodiless spirit. We will have fit form and function in some capacity in our heavenly existence. And to put what Paul is saying here into context for the time, the church at Corinth is in central Greece. The Greek philosophers all thought and taught that a bodiless spirit was the highest level of existence that one could achieve. They thought of the body as a prison for the soul and saw absolutely no advantage of being resurrected into another body. But to God, the body itself is not a negative. The problem isn't in the body itself, but it's in these sin-corrupted fallen bodies that we have inherited from Adam and Eve's original sin, and now we must live in it. 
Jesus approved the essential goodness of the body by becoming a man himself. If there was something inherently evil about the body, then Jesus could never have added humanity to his deity. When Paul says that mortality may be swallowed up in life, he is just saying that our new resurrected, resurrected bodies will not be subject to death, mortality. Instead, as Paul previously wrote, and we learned back in 1 Corinthians 15, that death is swallowed up in victory. When we receive our eternal bodies, we will have a completely conquered death forever. All right, let's do verses uh, 5 through 8 next. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Uh, so these verses are uh, kind of important. We haven't had this doctrine yet, but it is taught so differently in so many different uh, churches and denominations and religions. So uh, we're going to set it the way that we see it here. Now, God is preparing us right now for our eternal destiny. destiny. And how, mu how might he do that, you ask? Well, we learned how last week during Pastor John's message from Paul, from chapter 4, which said, From our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceedingly for our eternal weight of glory. So in other words, God allows certain trials and tribulations to take place in our lives right now in order to better prepare us for the truly wonderful things that are to come in heaven. If everything were all roses without thorns in our human lives right now, then we may never feel the need to look forward to a rosy time in heaven and resultantly would not seek out our God by thinking, I don't need heaven. I have everything I could possibly want right here on this earth. Now, as a guarantee to the promises that God made of heaven, he gave us the Holy Spirit as a down payment right now. The Greek word used in the original manuscript is arhabon, which means a pledge or a partial payment that required a future payment, but gave the one receiving the guarantee a legal claim to the goods in question. So God gave his believers a partial payment right now towards their future rewards in heaven by the Holy Spirit. When the trials get especially tough down here on earth, it isn't always easy to take comfort in our heavenly destiny. And sometimes we might even blame our own afflictions on God himself, rather than our own actions. But everything that's in God's plan is done for a reason, and it is allowed to happen to us for a much greater benefit in that overall plan. But true believers have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us through these trials. But we must believe that he is there in us and to ask him to help us when we need it. We can't just be complacent and not ask for help, thinking to ourselves, well, the Holy Spirit, if he truly loves me, then he won't let bad things happen to me. No, it's not. It's just the opposite. God doesn't cause bad things to happen to us. It's the devil and our inherent sin. But to, ne to negate that, we must continually work with the Holy Spirit to help us get through our trials. He is not going to do it on his own. We must be a willing co-participant with him. Paul says, so the Holy Spirit is a part of heaven itself. The work of the Holy Spirit is in the soul is like the bud of heaven. The grace given to us by the Holy Spirit is the bud that will eventually flower and flourish into true glory once we get to heaven, just like a bud grows and matures into a beautiful flower. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in Paul's life gave him confidence. It assured him that God was at work in him and would continue in his work. 
If you cannot say of yourself that you are always confident, then ask God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. When Paul says here, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, when we walk by faith and not by sight. Right now, the presence of God is a matter of faith. We are at home in the body, so there is a sense in which we are absent from the Lord, at least in the sense of his immediate and full glorious presence. So right now, we must walk by faith and not by sight. This is one of the greatest, yes, most difficult principles of Christian living. It must really amaze the angels in heaven that we, way down here, live for, serve, and are willing to die for a God who we have never seen. Yet we have him and we live for him, living by faith and not by sight. Yet the day will come when we will no longer be absent from the Lord, in the sense Paul means it here. On that day, we will not have to walk by faith, but we will see the glory and the presence of God in plain sight. The truth that Paul writes about here to be absent from the body means that we will be present with the Lord proves two false doctrines to, do, to be false. It refutes the false doctrine of soul sleep, which says that believing dead are held in some sort of suspended animation until the resurrect, resurrection and second coming occur. It also refutes the false doctrine of purgatory, which says that the believing dead must be cleaned up through their own suffering before they may be allowed to enter into the presence of God. Just imagine that if your own kid, who you have not been present with for a while, came to you with smudges and streaks and wants to immediately go up and hug you, but you immediately say, you immediately say, oh, don't touch me until you're all cleaned up and holy. I don't think so. All right, let's do uh, verses uh, nine, nine and 10, I guess. Nine and 10. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Since what we do right now has eternal consequences, that's uh, our little display over there, the red end of the rope. The red end of the rope right there signifies our life here on this earth and what we do for God right now. The white end signifies uh, all eternity. It, that white end goes through here, through there, out the back wall, out the door, just goes forever. That's uh, where we're gonna spend eternity and happiness forever. So what we do right now on this red end of the rope has eternal consequences. Our goal must persistently be to please God. And since right now we are absent from him, there are still some things that we can do now that we won't have an opportunity later to show him just how much we love him. When we get to our final destination, heaven, there will be no more need for faith, no more need for endurance through trials and tribulations. No more need for courage and boldness of telling others about Jesus. Now, while we are present in these bodies, these are our opportunities that we can live to show God how much we care about him. Never mind what anybody else thinks of you. Your business is to please Christ, and the less you trouble yourselves about pleasing men, the more you will succeed in doing it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When we pass from these bodies to the world beyond, we must each give an account according to what we have done, whether good or bad. But this is not the great white throne of judgment that Revelation 20 talks about. The judgment seat of Christ describes a judgment of the works of believers. The things done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. And what will be what will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, you might ask? First, what we have physically done, our actions and our words. 
Secondly, our motives and thoughts will also be judged. <coughs> it is possible to have a safe soul and a wasted life, and that will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. This should be an encouragement in our service to the Lord. It should remind us of the principle in Hebrews 6.10, which says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown yourself towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Paul knows that the troubles of this life are worth it because he will be rewarded for them at the judgment seat of Christ. We must also live understanding that our motives for what uh, will also be judged. We learned this back in 1 Corinthians 13. One can do, say, and act out the right things, but with the wrong heart. God will often still use that person and even bring great blessings to them, yet in the end it is as if they did nothing for the Lord because their motives or service do not stand up at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul presents essentially the same thing, same idea here back in 1 Corinthians 3, where he spoke of a coming assessment of each one's work before the Lord. And in that passage, he makes it clear that what we do and say and our motives for doing them will be tested by fire. And the purifying fire of God will burn up everything that was not of him. We won't be punished for the things, for those things will simply be burned up. And it will be as if we never did them. We will simply be rewarded for what remains after that. Some of us will get to heaven thinking we have done great things for the Lord. And we'll find out at the judgment seat of Christ that what we really did was pretty trivial in comparison to our whole lifespan here on this earth. Again, what we do here on the red end of the rope will determine how we will spend eternity with him. All right, let's go to verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Basically, Paul is saying here that knowing the judgment that unbelievers are going to face in the end from the terror of the Lord against evil by being thrown into the lake of fire, we as Christians who are well known to God and therefore not subject to that terrible destiny, we need to be persuading as many men as possible to come to Jesus. This should be at the heart of everyone who presents the gospel, whether it is delivered from a pulpit such as this one or simply done out in our mission field to the places that we go to once we leave out those doors out there in the back of the church, out in public where we kind of rub shoulders with common everyday people. We should always be intending to persuade men towards God and eternal salvation. We are not simply standing here casting out ideas and seeing which ones stick in people's minds or without ever caring how men will respond to them. We should be like Paul who passionately desires that men and women come to Jesus. We must intend in our hearts and in our words and in our actions to persuade men. Remember that Paul has already taught us how to persuade men in order to win them over to Jesus back in 1 Corinthians 9, and I'll paraphrase it for you. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak etc., etc. In my case, it was to the quantum physics techie. I became and spoke as a quantum physics techie in order to reach a quantum, uh, quantum physics techie, Lenny, when I was down in Florida two years ago. I'll paraphrase what Paul is saying in the last part of this verse. Since we are physically well-known to God, I also trust that you are well known to God in your consciences too. 
Don't just outwardly look the part or act the part, but subconsciously also play the part that Jesus wants to see and not what we like to think about, like the thoughts of the world, the flesh, and the devil himself, which others can't see, but God certainly can. All right, uh, let's see verse 12. So, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give your opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in their parents and not in heart. So Paul is basically saying that we must be humble and not just go around looking for praise, especially in outward appearances. Remember, the Corinthian Christians looked down upon Paul because he was a common laborer a tent maker, a leather worker, and they tended to look down their noses at people like that in their society, a, so a society of Greek philosophers and big thinkers and problem solvers. But Paul is telling them that they have something even better to be proud of, which the big thinkers don't have, a humble heart of righteousness. What do you glory in? Are you among those who glory in appearance and not in heart? Remember from our Bible study of 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel was about to anoint a different king other than Saul, who had fallen out of favor with the Lord. The Lord told Samuel to go to Bethlehem to consecrate Jesse and his sons. And Jesse brought his eldest, most biggest, most good-looking son, Eliab, before Samuel and said, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. Just look at him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks inside the heart. Amen. So uh, seven, uh, seven of Jesse's sons went before Samuel, and the Lord had not chosen any one of them. Samuel asked, is there any other one? Jesse replied, Just the youngest little runt out there tending the sheep. Samuel asked that he be brought before him. It was little runty David. And the Lord said to Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Exclamation mark, which is not used too much in the Bible. And the rest is history. David became Israel's second most beloved king in history after Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, the highest of the kings of all the earth. And after Jesus was resurrected, now Jesus sits at the right hand of God on the throne of his father David himself. All right, let's do verses uh, 13 through 15. <clears throat> If we are beside ourselves, think crazy here, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one, that's a capital O in the New King James Version, that would be Jesus, died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer for themselves, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. The Corinthian Christians might have thought that Paul was a little crazy because he seemed content with living a life of pain, trials, and discomfort if it brought glory to God. But basically what Paul's saying is that if I'm beside myself, it is for God, or whether we are sober and of sound mind than is for your cause. Either way, Paul is introducing the subject of love here as a constraining force within his life. He's not really talking about motivations to his ministry here, though we so often hear this as being one of the motivations to the ministry. Whenever Paul talked about the love of Christ, he was thinking of one thing, the cross of Jesus Christ, the only way God has ever sought to show us or to prove to us that he loved you and I by sending his son to die for all of our sins. 
Whenever God wants to declare his love for us, he always declares it through the cross. And so we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. All right, let's do verse 16. Because of, oh, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. And why is this, you might ask? Because we learned from last week's message that we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. And from earlier on in this chapter, we learned that our earthly tent will be destroyed, but we will have a new body, eternal in the heavens. And because we walk by faith and not by sight, and because we do not glory in appearance, but we glory in heart. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is a promise for anyone. It says right here, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, it doesn't matter what class, what race, what nationality, what language, or what level of intelligence you are, anyone can be a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if you do choose to be in Christ, then you will become a new creation by being born again. And you will live a new life with Jesus as your focal point now. This is the principle of regeneration. The saved are not just forgiven, but they are changed into a whole new creation. However, being a new creation doesn't mean that we are perfect either. It just means that we are changed and that we are in the process of being changed. But this also isn't just turning over a new leaf or getting your act together either. The life of a new creation is something that God works in us using our own will and our own choices. Ephesians 4.22 tells us that we are to put off the old man and to put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. All right. We're going to do verses 18 and 19 next. These last few verses of this chapter have to do with uh, the term reconciliation and they're kind of important and uh, we'll, I'll explain why as we go through it. So 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, excuse me, the reconciliation that is that God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So Paul's soars high here and wants the Corinthian Christians to know that he is writing of things that are of God and not of man. This work of a new creation are, and our eternal destiny are works of God, not something that we have to earn or to achieve. The principle of reconciliation <clears throat> is the end of the estrangement between God and man, which was caused by man's original sin. God initiated this ministry of reconciliation to us through Jesus Christ. God is the innocent party here in this estranged relationship. He reconciled us to himself. We did not reconcile ourselves to him. And more importantly, God did not reconcile us to himself by 
neglecting his holy justice or giving in to our sinful, rebellious humanity either. He did it by an amazing, righteous sacrifice of love. God demands not one bit less justice and righteousness from man under Jesus, but the demand has been satisfied through Jesus. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself is all the more amazing when understood in light of what happened on the cross. At some point in time, just before Jesus died, before the veil was torn in two, before Jesus cried out, it is finished, an awesome spiritual transaction took place. The Father set upon the Son all the guilt and wrath that our sin deserved. And Jesus bore it himself perfectly, totally satisfying the justice of God for us. We recently learned in our Bible study in Isaiah 53 that Isaiah said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, meaning Jesus. In and of itself, the suffering of the Son did not please the Father, but as it had accomplished the work of reconciling the world to himself, it completely pleased God the Father. All right, uh, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Paul sees that he is serving in a foreign land as the representative of a king. The king has a message, and Paul is delivering that message as though God were pleading through us. And there is a lot to being an ambassador. An ambassador does not speak for himself. He speaks to an audience, but to please the king who sent him. An ambassador does not speak on his own authority or about his own opinions either. But an ambassador is more than just a messenger. He is also a representative, and the honor and reputation of his country are in his hands. Paul then says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As an ambassador, Paul makes a simple, strong, and direct plea. Be reconciled to God. This statement makes it clear that the work of reconciliation mentioned previously in the chapter, does not work apart from our own will and our own choices. We are the ones reconciled to God. Those who have responded to Jesus' plea made through his ambassadors, and it also made it clear that it is we who must be reconciled to God, not he to us, for we are the party that are in the wrong. All right, uh, and then the last verse in this chapter, and I'm going to tell you right beforehand that this is a, being such a simple statement, it's very controversial. And uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. This particular verse is one that's highly fought over in the arena of the higher theologians, such as Calvin and Arminius is of the doctrine of impute, imputation. It speaks directly of how God made reconciliation even possible. I'm not going to get into all the specifics of all the different points of view, as this would require a whole semester of study. But I will tell you in general terms what this means and why Paul chose to include it to the Corinthian Christians. We all know that Christ was sinless, right? But some, like the Corinthian Christians, believed that since he came from a sinful woman, that he couldn't possibly be truly sanctified by the Spirit of God. However, most theologians preach that Christ only appeared in the likeness of sinful flesh, for he was still deity, although with scaled down or limited powers, but that was of his own choosing. But besides all this, he was made sin itself by imputation, to be sin for us. Therefore, the sins of all his people were transferred unto him, laid upon him, and placed to his account, and he sustained their persons and bore their sins 
and having them upon him, and being chargeable with and answerable for them, he was treated by the justice of God as if he had been not only a sinner, but a mass of sin, which God could deal with in one fell swoop, having Jesus die on the cross for the entire world's sin. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul carefully chooses his words here when he says, He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He does not say that Jesus was made to be a sinner. Jesus never became a sinner, but he did become sin for us. Even his becoming sin wasn't a righteous act of love and not an act of sin like some religions preach. And Jesus was not a sinner, even on the cross. On the cross, the Father treated him as if he were a sinner, yet all the while, sin was outside of Jesus, not inside of him, and was not part of his nature, as it is with us. Uh, to, to further prove that point, let's uh, see what Charles Spurgeon, the famous uh, preacher, had to say. He speaks of Paul's verse here by saying, Christ was not guilty and could not be made guilty, but he was treated as if he were guilty because he willed to stand in the place of the guilty. <laughs> Yea, he was not only treated as a sinner, but he was treated as if he had been sin itself in the abstract. This is an amazing utterance. The sinless one was made to be sin, but was not actually sin itself. Paul goes on to say that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took our sin, but gave us righteousness. This is a tremendous exchange, all prompted by the love of God for us. What a grand thought that this is. The righteousness with Adam and in the garden was perfect, but it was the righteousness of man. Ours is the righteousness of God. The whole truth regarding reconciliation to God comes down to this. Our sins were on Jesus, and his righteousness is on us. And as Christ was not made sin by any sin inherent in him, so neither are we made righteous by any righteousness inherent in us, but only by the righteousness that Christ imputed to us. All right, so now we're going to do uh, chapter 6, and we're going to have to switch formats here. Back up. start out in verses uh, 1 and 2. We then, that's the ambassadors for Christ, as workers together with him, Jesus, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he, God, says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, Jesus, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, Jesus. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So, Paul sees himself as a co-worker with Jesus. They are partners. It isn't that God needed Paul, or any of us for that matter. Instead, it is that God wants us to be workers with him for our own good. It's like the little boy with the toy lawnmower following his dad around as he mows the lawn. For the sake of pure efficiency, the dad should just ask the little boy to go play somewhere else because he's just really in the way. But it's so valuable for the little boy to work with his dad. And because his dad loves his little boy, he wants to teach him, coach him, and work together with him. I remember working with my dad as a little boy. I was the errand boy. My dad would be working under our family car to get that thing going, and then my dad would tell me, go fetch this or go fetch that. 
so that he wouldn't have to keep crawling out from under the car. And it only takes a, a few errant runs before I learned the difference between what a hammer was and what a hacksaw was. Because I did not want to disappoint my dad. I wanted to help him by being his partner. So we, as ambassadors for Christ, should be doing the same thing, along with Jesus, working with him, learning from him, and trying not to disappoint him. And working with him does not mean working with God to make our own lives more comfortable or easier or more self-indulgent. No, God does not want us to become cups potatoes or pew potatoes. Paul goes on to say, we also plead with you, that's the Corinthian Christians, not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, to plead is to beg. And our dear Paul here certainly is one who is not too proud to beg, especially when eternity is on the line. The Corinthian Christian, Christians had obviously received the grace of God. They were not Christians at all had they not received the grace of God. Yet having received it, they were potentially guilty of receiving the grace of God in vain. So Paul pleads with them to not do this. So what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? Well, grace isn't given because of any works, past, present, or promise, yet it is given to encourage work. God doesn't want us to receive his grace and become passive. Paul knew that God gives his grace and we, the ambassadors, work hard and then the work of God is accomplished. Now, many Christians struggle with this very point. Is God supposed to do it, or am I supposed to do it? The answer is yes. God does it, and we do it. Trust God, rely on Him, and then get to work, and work as hard as you can. That is how we see the work of God accomplished. If I neglect my end of the partnership, God's grace doesn't accomplish all that it has the potential to, and therefore it was given to us in vain. All right, uh, those of you who are using the New King James Version of the Bible, which is great for teaching, will notice that verse 2 is indented. And that means that the scripture was taken from somewhere else in the Bible, usually from the Old Testament, as it is in this case. Not only that, but you members who regularly attend one of our weekly afternoon or nightly Bible studies should recognize the scripture in verse 2 as it comes from one of our very recent Bible studies from Isaiah 49. In an acceptable time I have heard you, capitalize Jesus, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, capitalize Jesus. Isaiah goes on to say, as a covenant to the people to restore earth. <coughs> now keep in mind, Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Jesus was even born, before the Messiah came. And here he is saying almost exactly what's going to happen. We learn from our Bible study that it meant that the Lord God was going to extend his help in preserving the upcoming Messiah all throughout his earthly history. Yet if there is any specific time that this promise... Uh-oh. I hit a button. Yeah, if there's any specific time that this promise is going to be fulfilled, then it would be as the Messiah would die on the cross for the propitiation to God for the atonement of sins, and then the resurrection was promised. Jump forward 700 years, and we now know that this prophecy was exactly fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross and ushered in a whole new covenant, which now includes what was called back what we learned in uh, Bible study, the coastlands, which meant far off lands, or at as it is now known as the Gentile, Gentile territory. 
Isn't it so cool that the entire Bible all ties together and so, so many prophecies came to exact fulfillment? That's what makes someone like me, a pretty scientific person, makes the Bible so believable. It's beautiful to imagine Jesus' soul being comforted and strengthened with these promises as he anticipated and endured the ordeal on the cross. He could know, based on this promise, that the Lord would hear, help, and preserve him. And, didn't, and Jesus didn't merely usher in a new covenant to all his people. He is the new covenant to all the people. Amen. And by quoting and applying Isaiah 49.8, Paul wants to give the Corinthian Christians a sense of urgency. God has a finite time for us to work in with his grace. Think that right in the rope right there. There is no time for Christian lives to be consumed with ease and comfort and self-focus. It's time to get busy for the Lord and to be workers together with him. Okay, verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Paul was willing to do most anything to make sure he gave no offense in anything. He was willing to forego his salary as a minister of the gospel. He was willing to allow others to be more prominent. Paul was not afraid to offend anyone over the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was willing to work hard and endure hardship. And he was not too proud even to get down on his knees and beg people for the sake of eternity. But certainly he would not allow his style of ministry to offend anyone. But Paul's ministry was wrongly blamed and discredited by the Corinthian Christians. What Paul means is that our ministry may not be rightly blamed. Paul could do nothing about the false accusations except live in such a way that any fair-minded person would see that such accusations are false. All right, let's go for verses 4 through 10. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the honor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. So Paul now recounts his resume to the Corinthian Christians. Here are the things he will list in order to even mention himself before them. And Paul's first qualification they mentions was patience. Patience. Uh, that's uh, that's the uh, English translation. The ancient Greek word for here, use here is hopamon, which is the idea of endurance rather than that of simply waiting. We often think of patience as a passive thing, the ability to sit around and wait for something to happen. That is not the idea of the word Paul used here. It is an active endurance instead of a passive waiting. The ancient Greek word hapamon does not describe the frame of mind which one will sit down with folded hands and bowed head and let a torrent of trouble sweep over them in passive resignation. No, it describes the ability to bear things in such a triumphant way that it transfigures them. In other words, it helps transform them into something more beautiful, more elevated in God's sight. Then Paul goes on to say, tribulations, needs, and distresses. In Paul's resume as an apostle, ambassador, and co-worker with Jesus, he follows patience with describing why he needs this act of endurance. First, it was because of the general struggles and trials of life. Paul was often stressed and under pressure. This is the idea behind the word tribulations. Often needy and often in distress. So he wants to make sure that the Corinthian Christians should expect the same, and so should we. 
Then Paul speaks of stripes, imprisonments, and tumults. As Paul continues on with his resume, he writes of sufferings directly inflicted by men. Stripes with wounds, wounds on the back from a whipping. Imprisonments refer to the frequent time Paul spent in jail, and tumults speak of the violence from an angry mob. Remember, Paul was stoned but lived when he went to Lystra, where his, where his apprentice Timothy eventually came from. Nowadays, it's not just the violence, but also the mockery or the amused contempt of the crowd against which the Christian must also stand steadfast. I can wholeheartedly attest to that. Paul mentions uh, labors, sleeplessness, and fastings. Paul continues his resume with describing his self-inflicted hardships. No one made him work so hard, keep so many sleepless nights, or go without food so often. These were true trials, but one that Paul chose willingly as a co-worker in Christ. Paul isn't complaining about these, but they were self-inflicted, but they were relevant to his original attribute of patience. Paul knew he needed endurance, and he knew many things in life drew him to seek that endurance. Some of them were just the general trials of life, some were sufferings directly brought on by others, and some were self-inflicted. And not every trial was the same, but they all made him need endurance. Then Paul mentions, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Here Paul begins to describe the resources that he took advantage of in triumphing over adversity. If he honestly listed his trials, he will also honestly list the fruit of the Spirit and the power of God in his life. The idea of on the right hand and on the left is of holding both an offensive and a defensive weapon. It signifies both being attacked, attacked while still advancing the kingdom work. In particular, in particular, think of a shield like the shield of faith in our left hand, while our right hand we wield the sword of truth, God's word as our offensive weapon against the devil and all of his evil men. And that's why Pastor Terry always instructs us every week to don the entire armor of God every single day. And I always instruct people to wield the sword of truth through a simple verse of the day. Sometimes we get caught up in the fast-paced business of, of work in our society and don't always have nor take the time to read our Bibles every single day. But if you receive any kind of email from me, whether it's one of business or encouragement or for just plain Christian fun, then you will receive at the minimum one verse from God, which we can then apply to our lives that day. In these ways, we are holding both our offensive and defensive weapons needed to carry out God's plan for us and advance his kingdom and sternly say to Satan, like we did this morning, not today, Satan, and his cohort who is working with working for for him to bug you will flee from you and go pick on a much easier target. Paul concludes his resume by listening, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and, and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Here Paul lists all his references that people can check about his past experience, both what the world thought of him, but most importantly what God thought of him. The world, including the worldly Corinthian Christians, described Paul with words like dishonor, evil report, deceivers, unknown, dying, chastened, sorrowful, poor, having nothing. Yet God's reference, God described Paul with words like honor, good report, true, well known, behold we live, not killed, always rejoicing, making many rich, and possessing all things. So, which description was really accurate? The world's or God's? Well, we learned the answer to this in last week's message, in which, by the way, we had a nice, lively, and productive 
What did you learn from today's message at the end? 2 Corinthians 4 gives us the answer. Wow, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, like that red end of the rope, but the things which are not seen are eternal, like the white end of our rope. Amen. So technically, they're both accurate. According to the things which are seen, the world estimation was correct. According to the things which are not seen, God's estimation was correct. So the real question is, which estimation is more important to you? All right, let's do verses uh, 11 to 13. Oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open to you. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open. So, Paul has spent enough time laying down the principles. Now he makes it a pointed appeal to the Corinthian Christians. We can sense the depth and passion in his heart as he cries out, Oh, Corinthians! Paul is practicing what he has been preaching by speaking the truth to them in love. He genuinely loved the Corinthians with an open heart, yet he would also speak openly to them. And sometimes speaking openly hurts. Pastor John always teaches us this principle, that sometimes we may offend you when we preach to you or counsel you, but keep in mind that we only have your best interests in mind, according to God's word, because your salvation and where you spend eternity is on the line, and we love you and want to see you in heaven on the white end of the rope, out there forever. Then Paul says, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. The Corinthian Christians were playing the victim before Paul. Also, as Pastor John always teaches us, they were throwing themselves a pity party. But also, like Pastor John teaches us, Paul, out of godly necessity, was not going to join in on their pity party either. Paul had been firm with them on many previous occasions. Now, they're claiming to be restricted by the hurt that Paul had caused them. They probably said, we would love to reconcile with you, Paul, but the pain that you caused us really, really restricts us. We just can't go get over it. Well, newsflash, get over it. We have bigger things to worry about in advancing the kingdom than what someone did or said to disappoint you. That's what Paul's doing here. But the real problem was that the Corinthian Christians were restricted by their own afflictions. Their love for money, the flesh, and everything that the world had to offer them. The same things that most people crave today, too. It wasn't that Paul did not love them enough, which was their claim as being the victim. It was that they loved ungodly things and themselves too much. Their own affections restricted them. Paul wants to see the same self-searching honesty in the Corinthian Christians that he had just displayed to them. They had to do this so that they could be what we talked about in the last chapter, reconciled. The rift between Paul and the Corinthian Christians, which could be healed, but it was in the hands of the Corinthian Christians to do it. They had to also be open, them to the, open with themselves to God. All right, uh, let's finish up with verses 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, uh, these next few verses are indented, so I'm going to tell you beforehand where they come from. First one, this is from Ezekiel 37. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, this is from Isaiah 52. 
Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. And finally, this is from Jeremiah 31, verse 18. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul is speaking to the overly broad affections of the Corinthian Christians. They had joined themselves to unbelievers unequally yoked, and this prevented their reconciliation with Paul. The idea of do not be unequally yoked together is based upon Deuteronomy 22, 9, which prohibited yoking together two different types of animals. It speaks of joining two things that should not be joined. So you might ask, in what ways have the Corinthian Christians become unequally yoked together with unbelievers? How can this be? Well, a lot of pastors will say, certainly by marrying an unbeliever, which is the most common way this principle is applied. One preacher wrote, a very wise and prominent holy man was given his judgment on this point. A man who was truly pious, Marrying with an unconverted woman will either draw back to perdition or have a cross to always bear during his life. The same may be said of a pious woman marrying an unconverted man. Another preacher said, such persons could not say this petition, this particular petition of the Lord's prayer, lead us not into temptation, but they plunge into a head first of their own accord. However, Paul means much more here than only marriage, marrying an unbeliever. It really applies to any environment where we let the world influence our thinking. When we are being conformed to this world and not being trans transformed by the renewing of our mind, like Romans 2 12 tells us to do, then we should, then we join together with unbelievers in an ungodly way. Excuse me. This speaks especially to the issue of <clears throat> influence. Paul is not suggesting that Christians never associate with unbelievers. He made this clear back in the last chapter. The principle is that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Like a ship should be in water, but it shouldn't have water in the ship. If the world is influencing us, it is clear we are unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And this unequal yoke or ungodly influence may come through a book, a movie, a television show, a magazine, our cell phones, or even uh, through our worldly Christian friends. Most Christians are far too indiscriminate about the things that they allow to influence their minds and lives. Now the Corinthian Christians thought and acted like worldly people, not like godly people. They gained this way of looking at life, or at least they stayed in it, because of their ungodly associations. Paul is telling them to break those unequal yokes of fellowship with the ungodly. Paul uses the word belial here, which is a Hebrew word and not a Greek word, uh, like he's talking to in his audience. And that means worthlessness or wickedness. Here it is used as another word for Satan. The term is used only in this place in the whole entire New Testament, but used very often in the Old Testament to express men notorious, notoriously wicked and scandalous. And then he says, what common, what communion has light with darkness? By using the term communion, Paul indicates that he really means influence more than presence. Parties are said to be in communion when they are so united that what belongs to one belongs to the other, or when what is true of one is true of the other. We don't want that kind of association, godly with the ungodly. We are in almost every way totally opposite. Then Paul says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The Corinthian Christians still struggled with the idolatry problem. Paul re uh, referred to to back in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Their association with idols influenced their thinking, making, making it more and more worldly and therefore ungodly. Then Paul says that you are the temple of the living God. 
We went over this back in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul wrote of individual Christians as being temples of God. But here he's referring to the church as a whole being the temple. Because temples are holy places and should be protected against things that might defile the holy place, we should protect our hearts and minds as holy places before the Lord. But also keep in mind that this is a hospital and people come here to be uh, healed also. It's just that don't come in here with uh, foul minds all the time. Come in here with a good heart. Next, Paul uses several references to Scripture to, to make his point because God said it. As Paul quotes these passages, he doesn't necessarily quote them word for word either, from the Hebrew or from the Septuagint. When Paul quotes Scripture, he often paraphrases it. Remember, he, he can't go over and pick up a King James Version, a New King James Version, and look up what uh, someone said a few years ago. They heard it orally, and they would uh, put it in their mind. So he gets all the keywords right, but not word for word. So Ezekiel 37 tells us, God is in the midst of his temple. I will dwell in them and walk among them. And Isaiah 52 tells us how we should make that temple a holy place. Come out from among and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. The promise of, and I will receive you, reminds us that it is not only a separation from evil, but also a separation unto God. It's not a question simply of trying to empty your heart and life of every single worldly desire. That would be an impossibility given our sinful nature. Or rather, it is about opening up your heart wide to the love of Christ and letting that love just sweep through you till your heart is completely filled with love. In verse 18, Paul quotes from Jeremiah 31 to show the benefit of separating from worldly influences a more intimate relationship with God. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. There is always a glorious promise for those who are willing to separate themselves from the world's influence for the sake of godliness. So all in all, what Paul is saying here is that if we truly want to be reconciled unto God, like we talked about in the last chapter, then we need to renounce our sins and unyoke ourselves from the influences of the world. And that concludes our uh, scripture for today.